Well, we're going to be looking at Matthew 24, which you'll, you'll have on your, uh, inside your, your program there. Do I need to push this? Okay. And you know, when I was looking at this passage, this week, I was thinking, you know, it's almost a certainty that at one time or another in everyone's life, we thought about what it would be like to know the future. And there are some who might want to use it to plan, maybe avoid disaster. There are others who might like to know what the stock market's going to do over the next six months. I was thinking, you know, how much money could you make if you knew the result of every Saturday football game before kickoff? And it wouldn't even be gambling. And there are some who are simply curious about how things are going to end. And one only has to look at the number of people who read their horoscope every day, or they attribute their personality to the Zodiac, or how much money is spent on tarot card readers and seances to understand how interested people are in the future. I mean, there's really a fascination with prophecy. Still, I think a discerning and astute reader of these practices must realize how vague the prophecies actually are. The ancient Greeks would climb the side of Mount Parnassus and consult the oracle before making any major decisions. One king climbed up and spoke to the oracle, and the oracle told him that if he went to war, he would destroy a great kingdom. And the king, assuming the oracle was talking about his enemy, went to war and destroyed his own kingdom. So you see, I think that sums up the vagueness of, from which all these secular prophecies originate. And I say secular because as we come to our passage this evening, we find that Jesus is going to prophesy. He is going to speak about future events. Some of the events are going to take place shortly after his ascension into heaven, as well as events that would take place in the far distant future. In fact, we are still waiting for some of those events now, like the second coming of Christ. And in this passage, Jesus speaks about the end times, or to use the technical term, eschatology, which simply means the end times or, or the last things. And because of the prophetic nature of these verses, they have produced an array of eschatological schemes or ideas about the end times. These verses have taken some of the great minds the church has ever known in every generation, men with equal intelligence, men who equally love the Lord, and these verses have put them at odds with each other. You will have heard many of the schemes, the ones, some of the main ones are, well, I'm saying post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, preterism, and so on. But you'll be really pleased to know that's the last time I'm going to mention any of those schemes this <laughs> evening. But there are some things that we should keep in mind as we look at chapters 24 and 25, if we were to go that far. But because these chapters are really both a response to the disciples' questions to Jesus in verse 3. Therefore, as Jesus spoke to them, he must have expected them to understand at least something about what he was talking about as he prophesied. And secondly, I think we need to avoid the temptation of turning these verses into a mere curiosity. And remember that we are actually in the last 48 hours of Jesus' life on earth. And his teaching here is solemn and profound, and it contains warnings and prophecy for every Christian in every generation. So before I read these verses, let me just outline the flow of these two chapters, and you can have them in mind as I read the words. In verse 2, Jesus prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And then in verse 3, as we've already mentioned, the disciples approached Jesus with two important questions. Firstly, when will Jerusalem be destroyed? And secondly, they ask, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And we should note that before Jesus answers that first question, he warns them that there will be a period of time before his second coming that will be characterized by terrible and earth-shaking events. And then in verses 15 to 22, he prophesies in detail about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. And then in verses 23 to 28, Jesus underlines that the destruction of the Jerusalem is only one of the many horrendous things that will happen as world history unfolds. And he reiterates 
what they can expect in that period before his return. And then in verse 29, everything changes. Jesus begins to teach about his second coming. And he tells us what to expect when he does come. And then finally, verse 36, and all the way to the end of chapter 25, Jesus stresses the suddenness and the finality of his return and the need for his servants to be ready. So let me pray for us, and then I will read the, uh, the passage. <clears throat> Fathers, we open our Bibles to this most glorious and difficult passage. We ask that by your Spirit you would lead us in rightly dividing your word of truth. And help us to shun the worldly babblings that only serve to cause ungodly thoughts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, Pray that your flight may not be in winter on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes in the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
But concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, I was with a friend of mine, Reuben Hunter, this week, and I said I was going to do chapter 24 of Matthew. For first Wednesday, he said, really? I'll pray for you. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, chapter four, 24 does start with the disciples following Jesus away from the temple. And Jesus, in, in the chapter 23, had just finished his sermon on the seven woes, where each of the woes pointed to the judgment of the Jewish religious system and its leaders. And his last words for these leaders at the end of the last verse of chapter 23, he says to them, See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And with that, Jesus walked out of the temple, leaving the church leaders rebuked and incensed. And the disciples followed him, and they walked up the side of the Mount of Olives. Now, I am sure the disciples noticed that in the past, Jesus had always spoken of the temple as my father's house. But this time, at the end of 23, he called it your house. And he says it's been left desolate. In other words, Yahweh is not in the temple anymore. It's no longer my father's house. It's your house. And I can imagine the disciples being confused. And they must be somewhat worried by these events at the end of chapter 23. So as they climbed the Mount of Olives, one can almost imagine Peter or someone saying, Wow, Jesus, you were really angry down there in the temple. But look at all these buildings. Look as we stand here on the mountain. Aren't they beautiful? Aren't those buildings just amazing? And in their admiration for the beauty and the strength of the temple, and because of its place in Jewish society, they had not yet understood that the temple was going to be destroyed. So Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, makes it very explicit in verse 2. You see all those, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And in verse 3, we know from Mark's gospel that it was actually Peter, James, John, and Andrew who were approaching Jesus in private with these two questions. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And notice how they inquire about the destruction of the temple. When will these things be? And then how they ask, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? They appear to think of Jerusalem's destruction and his second coming the end of, as the end of history. At least one simultaneous happening as if it's all going to be one event at the same time. And their misunderstanding comes from the fact that for the Jews, the temple had always been the center of the nation, the center of their religious life. And for these Jewish men, it was impossible to imagine a world existing without the temple as the center of life. Therefore, in their minds, if the temple was going to be destroyed, then it made perfect sense that Jesus would come, history would end, and that would be that. So starting in verse 4, Jesus sets out to explain to these disciples that these events are not linked and how events are actually going to transpire as history unfolds. And as he does, he speaks not only to these disciples listening to him on the Mount of Olives, but to every member of the church in every generation until he does come. Which means this is an important moment. This is important stuff that he's teaching here. So let's examine what it is that Jesus was so concerned to teach so very near the end of his life, knowing that this would be probably one of his last moments of teaching on earth. Well, firstly, it doesn't appear that Jesus is the least bit interested in our arguments about the millennium and all the isms that we have produced. He makes no attempt to lay out a precise order of events or, or a timetable. But notice that before he answers the question, Jesus wants to preface his answer with a warning. Verse 4, he opens his response, see to it that no one misleads you. Then in verse 6, he says, see that you are not frightened. And have a look again at the text, and the thrust of these verses becomes apparent. Verse 4, watch out that no one deceives you. 
Verse 6, do not be frightened. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Verse 7, the nations will rise against nation. There will be famines and earthquakes. Verse 9, you will be persecuted and put to death, hated by everyone. Verse 10, many will turn from the faith. Verse 11, false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Verse 12, the increase of wickedness will cause the love of many to grow cold. Verse 24, false Christ will appear and perform signs that would deceive the elect if that were possible. And then in verse 30, he says the Son of Man will return in power and glory. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that without the exception of the promise that he's going to return for his people, everything he says promises nothing but wave after wave of difficulty, of trouble, sorrow, pain. And it's sorrow and pain so overwhelming that verse 10 says it has the intensity to make a professing Christian abandon his or her faith. And it's sorrow and pain that appears it's going to come from every quarter. Some of it will trouble the world as a whole, like wars and earthquakes or commercial airline crashes or school massacres or tsunamis or gang violence or, or the COVID virus. At this moment, I guess we were in the Sudan, we could add famine and drought to that list. I mean, it's simply a fact that many Christians have been caught up in faceless general devastation. They've lost their children and their families and their friends and their ways of life. But drought and famine don't single anyone out. These situations affect and destroy believers and unbelievers alike. These things devastate the world from time to time. And they overwhelm God's people along with everyone else. And in these situations, Christians are simply human beings. And we share with all other human beings the troubles of living in a fall world, laboring as it does under, under God's curse. But alongside that, Jesus says, there will also be times of trouble that will be specific to Christians. In verse 9, he says, they will be singled out for persecution. People will hate them and seek to kill them. The world will punish Christians for their loyalty to Christ and to his word. And we should remember how many Christians in the world today are suffering precisely that kind of trouble and sorrow. A recent example was over the summer, Sri Lanka, you may have noticed that the Christians were, were bombed in their neighborhoods. I mean, our brothers and sisters were simply singled out for persecution and death. And of course, we know of many other stories from Pakistan and Nigeria and China and so on. And Jesus says that <clears throat> even when these things happen, they're still not the signs of the end. All these things will be recurring events over and over and over again until he returns. Verse 6, he says, these things must take place, but that is not the end. They're going to be like birth pangs. They will start, they will get stronger and more painful and more frequent as time passes until the birth takes place. Now, I don't have any personal experience with birth pangs, but I have it on good authority that that's sort of how it works anyway. Anyway, what Jesus is saying here is that the difficulty and the persecution the temptations, the trials, the sorrows, and the pain will not only continue, but they will intensify with time, just like the birth pangs, until that moment when he actually does return. And he commands us in verse 6, when we see all these things around us, do not be frightened. They are only the birth pangs. And then in verse 13, he spells out the application. The one who endures to the end will be saved. And although it may sound strange to us, verse 13 is actually a word of encouragement. I mean, look at his words. The one who endures to the end, that person will be saved. Now, Jesus is not by any means putting a condition on, on our salvation. Uh, Jesus, actually, this is important. <laughs> by saying that, Jesus is not putting a condition on our salvation. But what he is saying to us is that what I am calling you to do, I know is difficult, but don't forget, there is hope at the end of the road. And as we noted, that is the application of his teaching in this entire section. He's imploring his followers in every generation to persevere and endure the things that they're going to face because the man and the woman who stand firm will be saved in the end. Therefore, 
in order to help and encourage us. He tells us about these things beforehand. That's his point in verse 25. Jesus is preparing us beforehand for what we're going to face. Now, up to this point, Jesus has focused on the second part of their question. What will be the sign of your coming? And he's told them that there will be terrible, distressful times prior to his return. But none of these are the end in the way the disciples are actually asking the question. In fact, verse 36 tells us that no one, not even the angels in heaven, not even Jesus, the son himself, can say when the end will be. But now, in response to their first question about the destruction of Jerusalem, when will these things happen? Jesus turned to the specific event of the judgment of Israel, and he, he amplifies what is in store for that specific generation. And as he does, he, he uses a future event which will not be that long away as an ugly and terrible example of the birth pangs he already forewarned them about. Firstly, notice he says there will be a warning sign before the event. Verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Those opening words in verse 15, the abomination of desolation, come from Daniel's prophecy around 600 years earlier that was first fulfilled in 167 BC when Antiochus IV entered the temple and he erected an altar to Zeus over the, over the altar of burnt offering and in total vandalism sacrificed a pig on God's altar there. However, it's clear from Jesus' words here that Antiochus' actions did not fully exhaust the prophecy of Daniel. In fact, Jesus exhorts his listeners and Matthew's readers to look for Daniel's prophecy again in a specific place in the near future. That's why he adds, let the reader understand this. And notice that the holy place and Judea are specific geographical sites. So Jesus had in mind another and even greater desolation that would take place. This time, not only spiritual defilement, but physical annihilation as well. And Jesus warns his people to flee Jerusalem. And his prophecy, we see, we can see the urgent, the violent effects of that event. And notice how these verses of destruction are bracketed in verses 16 to 20 by the need to flee, the need to take flight. And we know now that this prophecy in verses 15 to 22 was fulfilled in 70 AD when the Romans overran Jerusalem. Eusebius, one of the many historians who write about this, wrote that the Christians fled the city prior to its fall and found refuge in the mountains around a town named Pella. But he went on to say that for many Jews in Judea, when the Roman armies arrived and crossed the borders, they mistakenly fled to Jerusalem for safety and were caught up in the carnage. And we know from history, the slaughter and the disease and the famine were of just monstrous proportions. And still, as we know ourselves, that is not the last tribulation that's been suffered on earth since then. But for the Jewish nation of 70 AD, those in Jerusalem were slaughtered and the temple was destroyed, never to be rebuilt again. Not one stone left standing on another. And when Jesus had finished telling them about the future Jerusalem, he returned to teaching about the period between his ascension and the second coming. And his command there in verse 4, don't be misled, actually becomes his focus. Jesus says there will be false messiahs and false prophets who will exhibit great powers. Powers so great that they might even fool the elect, if that's possible. And false teachers have always been a concern for the church. I mean, Jesus refers to them several times in this passage. And so it has always been. Every generation of Christians has found it necessary to be on guard against false teachers, false messiahs, false prophets. Later on, the Apostle John will write in his first letter to the church, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Or Peter in his second letter to the church, There will be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. And the point is, the followers of Christ 
must ignore claims of anyone who says they are the Christ or they know the Christ or that they have found the Christ because when he does return, Jesus says it will be impossible to miss. It's going to be unmistakable. The Lord Jesus will not return to a secret hiding place or engineer somehow a secret return to earth. It won't be that <clears throat> some people have seen him and others will not have seen him. Jesus says, do not be duped by anyone who says that the Messiah is coming in secret. Nothing could be further from the truth. Verse 27, he says, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. The coming of the Lord Jesus is going to be easier to recognize <clears throat> than vultures finding a dead corpse in the desert. And Jesus says his return is going to be powerful. It's going to be illuminating. The Apostle Paul tells us that every eye is going to see it. Every tongue is going to confess it. And in verse 26, Jesus says when he comes again, he says he won't be staying out of the wilderness or hiding in the inner rooms. So don't believe people who say that kind of stuff. The return of Jesus will be nothing like anything we have ever imagined. And notice, too, that there will be signs when his coming. However, these are not signs that will help us prepare for his coming. Instead, these are signs that coincide with his return, which means when the signs appear, there will be no time left. Jesus says the trumpet will sound. The angels will be sent to gather the elect. The sign of the Son of Man, whatever that is, is going to appear. The sign of tribulation will be over and this age will have ended. And Jesus says, that's how it's going to end. And as dramatic as that is, Jesus is using this prophecy to teach his followers several important lessons. And they're right here in the text. Don't be misled. Verse six, don't be frightened by the birth pains. Verse 13, stand firm to the end. And verse 14, preach the gospel throughout the world. Now, I do understand that much, if not all of this, can seem unreal and detached from our situation here on this Wednesday night in Hammersmith. The sorrows and the distresses that we see in the UK are nothing like what we would see if we were in Syria or Sri Lanka or the Ukraine. And living as we do and where we do, it is possible for us to feel immune to the extremes of the birth pangs or, or the tribulation that Jesus forewarns us about. But think about this. Jesus had no need to tell his disciples on the mountain that day or to make it known to all the generations that have come since, including us, that we must stand firm if we were not going to be seriously tempted at some point to turn back and give up following Christ. I mean, his own life was hard. There was opposition and hatred toward him from almost every quarter. And in verse 9, Jesus reminds us that the servant is not above his master. If they hated Jesus, they will hate us also. And as we know, that his purpose was to prepare us for the hard going ahead that so we won't be surprised or, or caught off guard by it. And just think of the context in which he's teaching. The Lord Jesus knew with absolute clarity about the storm that was about to overtake him in the next day or so. He felt the animosity of the religious leadership, and he knew very well that that same bitter, bitter hatred would begin and start to infect the crowd as well. And really, he couldn't do anything about that. You see, they wanted him to do something other than what his father had sent him to do. They wanted a king to lead them and expel the Romans. But Jesus came to suffer and die for the sins of his people. They wanted the kingdom of God to come on earth. But Jesus came to earth so that he could open up a way to heaven for those who put their faith in him. Jesus was on the eve of suffering the most cruel and unjust death because he was about to be caught up in the vortex of man's rebellion against God. And feeling these forebodings so clearly, still he found the compassion 
and the love to set them aside, and he turned his attention and his thoughts and his efforts to his disciples in order to be sure that they understood what they would face in this world because they were his followers. And just listen to him as he tells us what must come before the end of the age. War, natural disaster, persecution, violence, false teachers, lawlessness. And all of these things taken together, he says in verse 8, are only the beginning of the sorrows. The, the start of the birth pangs. The end will not come until these things have repeated themselves again and again and again. And with each repetition, they're going to become more intense than the last. And what is his concern? Really? I mean, why is he painting such a dark picture of the future for us? Well, I think he doesn't want us to grow spiritually complacent as time goes by, nor to be surprised by the difficulties of being a Christian in a world that is so sold out. To rebellion against God. He wants the foreknowledge that false messiahs and teachers would come to keep his people from being deceived. And he's told them all these things in advance so that in the midst of adversity, we wouldn't feel like he had abandoned us or, or forgotten about us. You know, in the very last verse of Matthew's gospel, Jesus tells his disciples, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that promise should indeed be a comfort for a, a Christian in difficult times as he or she lives in a world that gives little credit to their faith. A world that lives without any regard for Jesus and his kingdom. And yet a world that seems to prosper and flourish in its unbelief and rebellion. But Jesus says, I am with you always. Which means the people of God should derive comfort and consolation encouragement from the foreknowledge that human history as it unfolds is a story with a divine author and that's why christians should stand firm in the face of intense trouble when it comes because the lord is in control of history he's in control of the persecution in sri lanka he's in control of the ukraine he's he's in control of earthquakes and hurricanes He's even in control of our lives as we live here in Hammersmith and Ealing and the surrounding areas. He knows what's coming and what's more, he's told us what is coming. So you see, the Christian knows precisely how history will unfold and he or she knows how it will end. We just don't know exactly when it will end. The Christian's hand stands firm because no matter how difficult things become, the Lord of all history has already made known to us what must come to pass before his return. And the Lord Jesus says that he will not fail to reward his followers for their courage and their steadfastness when he does. And what should be, I think, perfectly plain to any reader who understands the sovereignty of God is that history is not unfolding spontaneously. It is moving on the course that has been ordered and designed for it. It's moving with the purpose toward its appointed end. And the Lord expects us to find great comfort in the fact that the difficulties we face, first as human beings and then as Christians, are all chapters in a book that have already been written. And a book, at least for Christians, that has a wonderful and a fantastic ending. However, in the meantime, Jesus says there will be a great deal of standing firm that will need to be done. And until Christ comes, the world is going to remain a battleground between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the evil one. And it will be the scene of a continuous and vicious rebellion against God on the part of the human race. But you see, in the final analysis, this world does stand under the judgment of God. It will never escape the evidence of the power of God's wrath. And God is on his throne and all of history is unfolding as it must. And everything is marching to a, a relentless drumbeat to Christ's triumphant return at the end. So as we close, I think we should note just one more thing that Jesus, when he told his disciples about all this is to come, he, he never said anything about 
how happy they would be walking with the Lord or about the satisfying work that he would have for them to do or the wonderful happiness they would share. He said nothing about the sublime love that can be found in, in a marriage, a Christian marriage, and so on. And I mean, he didn't mention any of these things, even though we all know that those blessings exist in abundance in the Christian life. But you see, his time was short. He only had a few hours left to open his eyes, open the eyes of his people to the fact that they must stand fast in a world that is going to threaten their faith. So his message is clear here. The world is not our playground. It's our battlefield. But he also says, we're not to worry. We're not to allow ourselves to be upset or alarmed by what happens. He told us in advance in order to assure us that as surely as wars and earthquakes and persecution would come, so just as surely will the Lord return and appear once more in the heavens. He will send his angels to the four winds. He will gather his people to himself and he will give each one of us a share in his victory. But until that moment, Jesus says, we must expect to find a terrible and destructive wind in our faces. There are times when we're going to feel the surge of the storm. But so long as we stand firm to the end, we will prevail. Because all these troubles are just the run-up. The birth pangs to the triumphant return of the King of Kings. And that will be the day. So Jesus wants us to keep our eyes fixed on it. And the prospect, with your eyes fixed on the, the return, the prospect will make even the deadliest storms, the worst sadness, sorrows, and troubles, actually a reminder of that last day, the final great day of the Lord. And if that is the ground on which you and I stand, then even the worst storms, the worst troubles, the worst sadnesses can become exhilarating as they remind us of the victory. <laughs> So when you find yourself in the storm, stand fast and think to yourself how your heart is going to fill with joy when the sign of the Son of Man actually does appear in the sky. Let's pray, shall we?